Welcome to this session of literary criticism, where we would be looking into Biographia Literaria, the magnum opus of Coleridge. Coleridge's Biographia Literaria is considered to be the most difficult book to comprehend. The treatise turned out to become an intellectual collage because he had apparently decided to integrate his biography with his critical theory. Biographia Literaria explores the conflicts in the poet's mind, the incongruities between the text and meaning and the probable difficulties in writing, reading, forming a critical discourse, editing the text, providing shape and form to his line of thought for directing his intentions. Chapter 13 provides insight into Coleridge's definitions and distinctions between primary and secondary imaginations and fancy. Coleridge's brief discussion of imagination, primary and secondary and fancy in chapter 13 of Biographia Literaria has been called perhaps the most famous single prose passage in all of English literature, yet also one of the most baffling. Let us now move on to describe what Coleridge has to say in the essay. Coleridge begins the essay by giving the quote of Descartes, who once said, give me matter and motion and I will construct you the universe. In the same sense, the transcendental philosopher says, I quote, grant me a nature having two contrary forces, the one of which tends to expand infinitely while the other strives to apprehend or find itself in this infinity and I will cause the world of intelligences with the whole system of their representation to rise up before you. According to Kant, it is the duty of the metaphysician to find out whether the mathematical method might not furnish materials or at least provide hints for establishing and pacifying the unsettled, conflicted and confused domain of philosophy. He briefly illustrates the utility of such an attempt with regard to the questions related to space, motion and infinitely small quantities as employed by the mathematicians and then he proceeds to the idea of negative quantities and their transfer to metaphysical investigation. According to Kant, opposites are of two kinds. One, the logical, which is absolutely incompatible, and the other, the real, without being contradictory. Two equal forces that act in opposite directions, both being finite and each distinguished from the other by its direction only must neutralize or reduce each other to inaction. Transcendental philosophy demands that first, two forces that counteract each other by their essential nature should be considered to be a primary force from which the conditions of all possible directions are derivative and deducible. Secondly, that these forces should be assumed to be similarly infinite and indestructible. In this case, the problem then will be to discover the results of the product of two infinite and indestructible forces as distinguished from the results of those forces which are finite and derived their differences due to their direction. After we have formed a scheme or outline of these two kinds of forces and of their different results by the process of discursive reasoning, 
we have to move from the notional to the actual. This can be done by contemplating intuitively about one power with its two inherent indestructible yet counteracting forces. Generations would interpret the forces and find existence in the living principle and in the process of our own self consciousness. The instrument that would make the solution possible would discover at the same time for who this would be possible. Poetic genius and the philosophic bent of mind are differentiated from the highest perfection of talent by kind and not by degree. The counteraction then of the two assumed forces does not depend on their meeting from opposite directions. The power which acts in them is indestructible and infinitely cheerful. The product formed from the two forces acting on each other must be a tertium liquid or finite generation. This is what Coleridge has actually mentioned. Consequently, this conception is necessary. Now, this tertium a liquid can be no other than the interpretation of the counteracting power, power taking of both the forces. Coleridge developed his thesis only up to this point, because his friend informed him that his opinions and methods of argument were entirely new. What his friend had supposed to be was weakened by Coleridge into shadows. Coleridge's friend advised him to withdraw the chapter on imagination from this book for the common reader would not be able to understand such complex statements. Coleridge accepted his friend's advice and presented briefly his views on imagination and fancy. He says, I quote, the imagination then I consider either as primary or secondary. The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. The secondary I consider as an echo of the former coexisting with the conscious will, yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of its agency and differing only in degree and in the mode of its operation. It dissolves, diffuses, dissipates in order to recreate or where this process is rendered impossible yet still at all events it struggles to idealize and to unify. It is essentially vital even as all objects as objects are essentially fixed and dead." Unquote. Coleridge explains that primary imagination is responsible for insight which means that it is impossible for objective perception. Perception is subjective. The poet's creation of I am is the poet's own expression of the infinite. Coleridge believed that the ability to be reminded of I am would lead the writer to move gradually from the finite to the infinite. Secondary imagination recreates by its capacity to dissolve diffuse and dissipate. We shall now move on to Coleridge's definition of fancy. After making this distinction between imagination and fancy, Coleridge moves on to tell us why he thinks imagination to be more powerful and more superior when compared to fancy. I quote Coleridge, fancy 
on the contrary has no other counters to play with except fixities and definites. The fancy is indeed no other than a mode of memory emancipated from the order of time and space and blended with and modified by that empirical phenomenon of the will which we express by the word choice. But equally with the ordinary memory it must receive all its materials ready made from the law of association. Coleridge believes that fancy has more limitations. It originates from memory. If memory is not tied to time and space, we reach the realm of fancy. Fancy communicates through the association of ideas, while imagination is active and dynamic. Fancy is passive and mechanical. Imagination is significant and transformative. I quote Coleridge, a repetition in the infinite mind of the eternal act of creation and inventive genius, unquote. Imagination guarantees ingenuity and inventive aptitude. Let us now analyze chapter 13 by concentrating only on the most important points that Coleridge had to say. An analysis of primary and secondary levels of imagination is the only conclusive point Coleridge claims in chapter 13. Coleridge begins the chapter with the phrase on the imagination or SM plastic power. Coleridge refers to the SM plastic power of the imagination which means that imagination possesses the power to shape into one. The meaning of esemplastic is to shape into one. According to Coleridge, esemplastic power is intuitive and has the capacity to unite. Imagination is a faculty that sees the whole behind the parts, the one behind the many. Reason merely analyzes and reduces into parts, but imagination assimilates the parts into a whole and takes us to a hidden metaphysical unity behind multiplicity. Fancy is rational and decorative. A simile within a secular humanist poem is which one part of the whole is compared to another part of the whole is an example of such decorative fancy. Imagination is the capacity to imagine in a creative way and in the process perceive the oneness of the universe. The esemplastic power in all its degrees and determinations is not similar to Wordsworth's definition in the preface written in 1815. Coleridge's definition of imagination that is first outlined in chapter 4 and again at the end of chapter 13 mark the beginning and end of the discussion on imagination. Coleridge divides the concept of imagination into the primary and the secondary imagination. Primary imagination in Coleridge's view is the basic mental capacity to observe and organize perceptions from the external world and form a clear view of the world. It is considered to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. The power of primary imagination functions through the simultaneous working of the mind and nature. Primary imagination possesses the capacity to create or repeat in the infinite mind matters that associate the objects and processes of nature which themselves are products of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. Coleridge wanted to say that primary imagination is unforced, involuntary. And this is why he calls it the necessary imagination. 
Coleridge then moves on to describe what he terms secondary imagination, which is the human ability to move beyond primary organization, to reassemble elements or fragments, create new wholes and decipher new meaning. Secondary imagination is artistic creativeness or poetic imagination. Coleridge remarks that in common language and especially on the subject of poetry, we appropriate the name imagination to a superior degree of faculty joined to a superior voluntary control over it. This means that poetic or secondary imagination coexists with the conscious will. This willful and poetic imagination differs only in degree from the primary imagination. The poetic or secondary imagination is the exercise of free will, our only absolute self that controls and directs creativity. New images and symbols serve as the media through which secondary imagination reconciles the self-conscious mind to the previously formed image of the world involuntarily formed and provided by the primary imagination. The common man who possesses only primary imagination is devoid of the potential to create through imaginative vision. Primary imagination reproduces that which has been created in nature by other individuals. There is no originality in primary imagination because it can only repeat and copy but not create anything new. Secondary or poetic imagination dissolves, diffuses and dissipates what has been perceived in order to create, to idealize and to unify. The secondary imagination produces a true imitation, not a mere copy. This distinction that Coleridge makes between primary and fancy as well as primary imagination and secondary imagination holds the essential key to understand his theory of productivity and originality in art. Coleridge expresses the view that primary and secondary imagination are of one kind. The secondary imagination depends on the primary imagination for its raw materials to work on. So, it is not an independent activity. This means that secondary imagination thoroughly depends on primary imagination. Coleridge explains fancy in this manner. I quote, fancy on the contrary has no other counters to play with but fixities and definites. The fancy is indeed no other than a mode of memory emancipated from the order of time and space while it is blended and modified by that empirical phenomenon of the will which we express by the word choice. But equally with the ordinary memory, the fancy must receive all its materials ready made from the law of association." Unquote. To explain this, Coleridge considers fancy inferior to imagination, which does not have the power to create because it can only combine what it perceives into pleasing shapes. Fancy can neither fuse nor unify. It is the arbitrary bringing together of things that be remote and forming them into unity. Coleridge describes fancy as the faculty of bringing together images dissimilar in the main by some one point or more of likeness. In Coleridge's view, fancy is a kind of memory that brings together images at random and these images 
retain their specific and individual properties. Coleridge explains the differences between fancy and imagination by quoting two passages from Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. As an example of fancy, he quotes the lines, Full gently now she takes him by the hand, a lily prisoned in a goal of snow, on ivory in an alabaster band, so white a friend, and girds so white a fee. Coleridge locates fancy in these lines because the images do not make a way into one another. He provides the following lines to explain how imagination functions. Look how a bright star shooteth from the sky, so glides he in the night from Venus' eye. Coleridge notes how many images and feelings are here brought together without effort and without discord. The beauty of Adonis, the rapidity of the flight, the yearning yet helplessness of the enamoured gazer and a shadowy ideal character thrown over the whole. Fancy for Coleridge is just drapery of poetic genius, but imagination is the very soul which forms all into one graceful and intelligent whole. Coleridge's theory of imagination, like Wordsworth's, identifies poets as gifted individuals and separates them from the rest. Coleridge's theory of imagination also renders a vague difference between fancy and imagination. Furthermore, the human faculty of perception and imagination work together as a single process. It would be pointless to segregate or sort out the ways of trying to understand the creative process of the human mind. All this said, let us now summarize what we have done today. It is through inspiration that something entirely new is created. Fancy brings together components which enter into new combinations, but the individual parts in the components do not undergo any changes. Creative acts are inspired by imagination and certain other facts that are deliberate and intentional are done almost mechanically. The mechanical could be made perfect by craft. Most good poetry has deeper insight and explains what has never been said before. However imaginative a poem be, it must in some way be connected with ideas that associate themselves with the reader. Human beings possess the capacity to reflect and comprehend by the process of association, but the genius is able to make associations not made before and imagination is the vital force that enables him to do so. Coleridge plays a lot of importance to secondary imagination which he considers to be the most important force that is responsible for meaningful creativity to take place. Thank you for watching this session. In the further questions that will follow, you would be able to understand more about what Coleridge wants to tell us about fancy, primary imagination and secondary imagination. In the sessions that would follow, we would elaborate more about Coleridge's theory and Coleridge's ideas and also find out the differences between Coleridge's conception of imagination, creativity and how are these concepts very different from what Wordsworth had to tell us. Thank you for watching. Till we meet next time. Bye.